Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Before I say the prayer of confession, I'd like to acknowledge something. I was going down 21st this morning and, and yesterday, too, and looked off to the side and saw beautiful orange trees and the changing of the colors of the trees. How majestic and beautiful is that? That is our beautiful God at His finest, showing us He's still right there in front of us. And just like the story and testimony that Tom gave us about this lady, God's at work. Sometimes we take so much for granted, but He's there for us all. Thank you. Prayer of Confession. God our Father, who does not change or waver, we come in confession to you for our sins. We praise you for not changing in your love and grace toward us. We come to you feeling free to share with you who we really are, because you know that we have done and said, and you still forgive us. We confess our inner thought life that is not always pure and good. We admit some of the things we do in secret that you see and know. We realize they are wrong. We vow not to do them, and yet we still get caught up in acting upon them. Praise you, Lord, for being consistent and giving us grace and forgiveness. When we are so inconsistent and fickle, through Christ we pray this. Amen. And our assurance of pardon come from Isaiah 1.18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And our guidelines from living come from Isaiah 1, 19, 20. If you will willingly obey, you'll feast like kings. But if you're willful and stubborn, you'll die like dogs. That's right. God says so. Thank you, and God bless you all, and have a great Sunday. Let's stand together and worship God with our praise choruses this morning.
For what to him we can look to Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The hymn was written as a letter to an ailing mother in 1855 by Joseph Scriven. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for your friendship. You didn't have to do that. But you not only became our friend, but you adopted us as children of the Heavenly Father. We give you praise for that, God. And we thank you for all the wonderful gifts every day that we see and experience. The things we have as conveniences. The joys that we share in our family tables. And for this Thanksgiving, as we come to you, Lord, with such gratitude for such a great nation. Lord, bless it. And bless these people that they give for your glory and for your honor, for the work and work to taught here, to save and to care for those who are lost. In Jesus' name, amen.
should have held on to the envelope. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, today we come to you. We thank you for such a beautiful life that you give us. For friends, for this family of God who are by our side and work together hand in hand to bring love and peace and the joy of Christ to the world. And Father God, we come to you for our nation. We have an election coming up very soon. We pray, God, that you will bring us leaders, that the mind of the people will see leaders that will be best for us and that will honor you. We pray, Father God, especially for our nation that is so torn and so different. There's so much of opposition and that we're so polarized, Lord, but we pray that you, the great God who began this nation with a group of people on their knees, building a constitution and building a declaration of independence and a bill of rights for people that have a society in which they're free to honor you. I ask you, Holy Father, for our leaders, that they will do that. I pray, Father God, too, for the brave men and women that protect us every day, both on foreign soils and here in this nation. We think of the struggling situations that we see in our society. I pray the tragedies that we saw this week of a mother shooting her child. I pray, Lord, for that mother to come to grips with what she's done. And I pray for others to see and understand how vile we can be without you, God. And that their hearts will be turned and changed. We pray for those who are broken, Lord. We think of our shut-ins. We think of Lucille and Joyce and Karen who want to be here but can't. And for others, Lord, that we know that battle on their beds every day that can't even get out of bed anymore. I pray, Father God, too, for a family this week I ministered to that the son no longer decided to be with them. I pray also for the little girl's family that was hit here on our side of town on 13th Street. Be with them and their brokenness and be with the fellow who hit them who I know is struggling very much. Just bring him peace and bring them peace and bring them comfort in a very tragic situation that never needed to happen. I pray also too, Father God, for Jim and his family as uh, Jim has passed away and be with them in their grief. I think of Martha's family also. I pray also too for my cousin Marlene and her family as they struggle with the loss of their son. I pray Father God too for Jim and Linda, both who had had surgery. And also Lord for Jackie, which has another surgery coming up. I pray also for Mike's dad. I think also, too, of Everett and Sharon, both battling, but still come here and are faithful. Lord, I pray for Samantha Mumma, who had to have another surgery this week, and for the struggles she's having with her brain cancer at such a young age. For Jason and, and, and Jordan, who's having problems in their lives with cancer. For Steve's mom, who's made a good recovery for Brad and Sega and the struggles that they have inwardly. For Mr. Mack and for Tim, both school teachers and for Tim with his uh, kidneys and Mr. Mack battling his cancer. For Floyd and Reva and for Rusty and Katrina all battling cancers. For Bill Rogers who had a stent put in this week and I was in Bible study on Tuesday morning, Lord. I just praise you for that. For Chaplain Hernandez and Chaplain Williams, who has to have a, a liver transplant after his heart surgery, Lord, just we pray for healing for him. For Lauren Pippen, who's 
dealing with Alzheimer's for his wife and also for his Parkinson's disease. We think of those who are addicted, Lord, who battle every day for Jordan, for Ryan, for David, for Eric, for Ricky, for Russell. Not only for them, we ask you, Lord, that they get victory over that and work in you, Christ, and get the power they need, but also for their families who've been with them and battled with them. And now, Father God, we pray that you'll be with us as we go through this, Lord, this lesson that you have so much spoken to us about and that what we needed, Lord, and just work in our lives, Lord, to hear your voice and hear your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in 1869, a new phenomenon came on, the Energizer Bunny. And what a marketing success it was. And it really laid out there with the blue sandals and the sunglasses and the big drum, how we need power and the good kind of power, especially from those energizing batteries and powering our toys and our lights and everything. It had 115 television spots and the word was spread throughout the land about this long lasting power. Now, each one of us love to have power, don't we? Some of us remember every month that we have to have power when KG&E sends us a little bill in the mail. We also know and we enjoy power luncheons, and we hear about power bars you can make and make you lift more or make you more healthy or embracing power selling or power searches or even power surges on our computers. And yet most of us feel like we're powerless at times. We're frustrated with life. We're disappointed. And today, Paul speaks to us about building within ourselves and understanding what God wants to do with us, which is to energize us, to give us a spiritual energy. When Jesus left the earth and as he was going up into heaven, if you remember in Acts chapter 1, he says, you will receive power, dunamis, dynamite, in your life. To be able to go into the world and preach the gospel, he said to his disciples. And that we also can have that same power in our lives. There's also, we talk about it in the New Testament. And here Paul, in prison, talking about the power. The Bible gives us Great understanding. Ephesians has been good because it's told us about what God has done for us. It's talked to us about what God has done for all of us. And now it's going to talk about what God wants to do in us and work his power for all of us to do the will of God in our lives. You know, it's not easy to be a Christian. In fact, it's getting harder and harder to be a Christian in our society today. It's being blocked out. Read your grandchild or your child's history book. And you'll see that on Thanksgiving, which is coming up, they talk about thanks, but it's thanks for the turkey, thanks for the Indians, thanks for being there, but they never mention about the pilgrims being thankful to Almighty God. That's left out. And we also will see as you go along in life, people ignore God. They're eliminating him from the scene. But the Apostle Paul comes with this great book in a very pagan society, just like we're living today. And it was even more pagan than we have it here, because at least we're not getting persecuted and put out to the lions. But Paul speaks in Ephesians 1, do you remember? All that God's done for us. Not a stick have we done for ourselves, for our salvation. But what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And now before the foundation of the world, he laid it out that he gave us the salvation. And how he predestined it. 
And then how he said we can experience it by Ephesians chapter 2, 8. For by grace we're saved through faith. That faith isn't even generated in you, but it's generated by the Holy Spirit in you to believe it. And that he's got work for us to do. He's got a mighty work for us to do. And that it's great that we see in chapter 3 then he opens up the door of this mystery. One of the mysteries for Paul was why God even chose him to be a minister to the Gentiles. Because he hated them so. And then the mystery that the Gentiles and the Jews would come together and be a whole new breed of people. The church who loved Jesus Christ. But today now, we find here, Paul had interrupted his prayer. And he had spoken to us about what his desire was for us and to become this great church and how that all was going to take place. But let me tell you something. He starts to pray. How many of you ever start to pray and your mind gets filled with all kinds of other stuff? Paul does this. If you look at his beginning of chapter 3, he was about ready to pray and then all the stuff revelation about the mystery of Christ was revealed to him and he was jotting it down but now we come back to the prayer in verse 14 and he is tells us and if you ever want to know what it's like to pray read the prayers of the Bible and you'll learn how to pray more efficiently more powerfully in your life and Paul begins his prayer And he speaks Trinitarianly. That he speaks to the Father. And the reason why he can go boldly to the Father is because of the Son, Jesus Christ. And that he has the ability to talk to God because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul does not pray about his physical needs. And he had many. But Paul doesn't pray about that. Instead, his prison prayers are more concerned for you and for me than about his health and well-being. And he gets very emotional about it, too. And the word today comes power. You see, in those first two chapters, in the beginning of the third chapter, he's enlightening us of what God has done. He draws back the curtain and shows us what God has done way back when, before the foundation of the world. But now, he wants us to embrace it. And embrace it not in our own power, but to have an enablement, a powerful enablement that does it. Beyond what we could have ever imagined before in our lives. And some of us struggle because we don't have that power. We don't grab a hold of that power. Like Paul wants us to do. And that's why his focus now is for us to understand it, but then be enabled by the power of God inside of our hearts to do it. And he begins his prayer. Notice what he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from every family in heaven and earth, derives its name. Paul is telling us that he comes before the Father who made it all possible for us. In the foundation of the world of eternity, he made it so that you are here today and that you are a Christian and that God has purposely opened you up. And let me say something to you. When you pray, you're opening up the window to your soul. Because how many of us pray for what's really important to us? And how many of us pray not about other things, but what we think is important? And Paul has three basic things that are very important to us. But a lot of us are afraid to pray. Sometimes we fear that we don't pray enough. And I, me, I've learned to pray on the run. In my car. Some people believe that I pray with my eyes closed when I drive. But in seriousness, I pray when I drive. I pray every chance I got. Because I know I need this power. And there's 
also the worry that, well, I just don't use the word. Talk to God like you would talk to your best friend because that's what he is. He knows what's on your heart, but he needs you to vent it, to get it out to you so that you can understand yourself and see how God is working inside of your life. Some of us are afraid to pray too because we don't think we have enough faith. The Bible says you have a mustard seed of a faith. God will be for you. Trust him and ask him to give you the faith. You look at Moses and Nehemiah and David. They, they didn't always feel like they had it. But they knew the one who did. That's what we have to have belief in. That God's the one who has it. And that even those impossibilities in our lives... God can make them possible if we trust him. And so he asked us in this passage and asked God to enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit to what he's already shared to us and revealed to us to take action on. So that we're enabled to act as true Christians. And we know how hard that is. Paul is giving these prison prayers. And he's asking for all of us, and not for himself to be healed and out of the situation that he's in. He is praying and asking for you and for me to grow and to be deepened in the inner man. That we have power inside of our hearts. And that we, our spiritual posture, begins... Notice what he does. He says, I'm on my knees. Can you imagine being changing on these rocks that he's basically standing on? He kneels there with his broken knees and hurt body. And he's before Almighty God pleading the case. We actually bow our knees. And the reason we do it for many different purposes. One of is because we admit that God is our authority. That we admit that we need him. And that the Father of God, Hood of God, is here. Your Father wants to hear from you. And the posture is of a humility, of brokenness, realizing how many times that we pray. I was reading a great book on prayer one time by a guy named by Holsby, he's a theologian out of Denmark. He said, You know what the most powerful prayer you pray? One word Help. Help God. How many of you have been in those spots where there's nothing you can do? And the only thing you can do is cry to the Lord, help me, Lord. And here we are. Paul's on that posture of bending his knee humbly before God. Broken before God and asking God for help. Those be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he speaks to God. You know, I've been teaching to my middle schoolers about, because some people get freaked out, you know. They think, well, this passage, if he's talking to the Father, then Jesus has not. No! He's talking to the Father because we have Jesus. A lot of people wanted to eliminate Jesus early on in the church. And make him just a man. I'm going through my middle schoolers, teaching them about church history, and how many people tried to devaluate Jesus and say he was a created being. But John really lays it on. He says, He became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus, fully God, fully man. And that the New Testament sense believed that and understood that, that they could go to the Father. Petitioning him on their knees because Jesus had done that for them. That was Jesus' posture, right? As he was going to the garden knowing that he was going to go to the cross, he got on his knees and he spoke to the Father. He laid out to his fathers what his concern was. And his posture was on his knees. Now we can pray when we're walking, driving, sitting. David sat sometimes and prayed. Solomon stood and prayed. The prophet stood and prayed. But when we go on to our knees, it's helpful. Because it brings us down and realizes understanding that we adore this God who's awesome. 
and who's tremendous. And that there's nothing we can do but pray. And we bring ourselves under his authority. And we realize his superiority. And we lift it up to him. And that it combats this dangerous attitude inside of our hearts. Of arrogance. Well, I'll just let you handle this part and I can do the other part, God. No, 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 no. We need him to handle it all for us. And that we go for him for the power that we need. Bowing demonstrates our adoration to God. That we respect him. I watched a woman one time with rheumatoid arthritis. And even when she had rheumatoid arthritis, she would get down on her knees before God. Now, we don't have to get on our knees. You know that. But what we're saying here is our hearts need to be on our knees for God and to God as we realize how important he is for our everyday living. Paul said it back in 13 last week. He talked about the trials and tribulations. These people were being taken off to the Colosseum, some of them, and eaten by lions and beaten and stabbed by gladiators because of their belief in Jesus Christ. And, and, and there was a saying in their day. And it was this. Kaiser Estan Curias, Caesar is Lord. And if you did not say that, you went to the Colosseum, got your head chopped off, or was eaten by a lion. And you see, they knew, Paul knew, the Christians would not bow. That's why many of them were slaughtered. And it's, the important thing is, is that our hearts realize the need for Christ. And so that position helps us realize that. That we need God fully for everyday activities. I mean, think about the things that bring you down. Sometimes monotony will bring you down. Sometimes trials will bring you down. Sometimes difficulties in relationships will bring you down. I was reading about Johnny Erickson. Many of you may don't know the story about her, but beautiful young woman at 17 years old jumps into the Chesapeake Bay and has a back injury that paralyzes her from the top down. In that time, she came to know Christ. In that time, she struggled and asked the Lord for the healing and believed he would, but it was not his will. And she became a prolific writer and speaker and with her mouth, even artist for the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day she was at a speaking engagement, and as she spoke, she asked people to come forward to Christ, and there were kids getting on their knees to accept Jesus. And she wept because she couldn't get down there and get on her knees. And she said, I prayed at that moment. I said, Jesus, I can't wait to get to heaven and be given a new body and to be able to kneel before you. And give you praise for being such a good God to me. And help me through this. That's what Jesus wants in our hearts. When you pray, go to the Father. And bow those knees inside your heart, if not physically sometimes. We need to do that. As Paul did here. And then look what Paul petitions for God. He says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power of the Holy of his Spirit in the inner man, so that you may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, Paul takes like a telescope and he begins to expand to us these desires that he has for us and for the Ephesian believers, that we might apprehend God's love, that we may know the strength and the depth and the comprehension and the fullness of God. You know, it, it, to feel that might and to feel God's presence to come over you and feel that might as you're going through difficulties. And if you notice, what he does in back in 13 already, now in 16, his spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, he comes alongside of us. And he teaches us these things. And he gives us the strength as we lean on Christ, the Holy Spirit comes inside and gives you the strength that you don't have. And it's immeasurable. Even in the impossible situations, He gives it to you. He gives you God's strength in the inner man. You know, there are times that, you know, we see, I go to the Y on Sunday morning, uh, not Sunday, during the week. And that parking lot at the Northwest is filled with people getting themselves in shape. But Paul's not worried about that body that's deteriorating and getting older. He's worried about the inner spiritual life. And that works inside of us. That gives us the strength that we need going through the difficulties of life that are hard, sometimes even unmanageable. This past week, I was with two people who are dealing with such tragedy in their life and how to grab hold of their life and let the peace of Christ come inside that heart so that he can, we can do the will of God and become stronger. This is what Paul is saying. He's praying for the inner spiritual life of each one of us. And that we learn God's will and that we learn God. And that we know him so well. And that we dig deeper. So that he can fill us abundantly. You know life evolves. Every day is a new thing. And it's hard sometimes. But every time you can open up the Word of God, it will give you strength, folks. And that we find inside of our houses, we go into the, our room of our hearts. And, and that's the beautiful thing about Scripture, folks. You know, I've read the Bible so many times, probably about, I think I now, it's 46 times in the last 46 years I've read the Bible. But every time I'm going through a situation, those verses that I know come alive and give me a whole new understanding of my situation that day. That's why it's so living and it's so active. And it turns me upside down and sometimes confronts me with a temptation. Or in time when I'm going through a difficult time, he's working inside me. Or as I'm working with somebody who's broken, the word comes alive. We see later on how that works out practically in chapter 5 and 6 in marriage and family and work. All that. And Paul wants us to be solid in our spiritual lives so that our spiritual faculties can handle no matter what is thrown at us. We can handle it. And that we're feeding the inner man. 
and that we have the strength of God in us. Because you see, like Paul says in Corinthians, he says, outwardly, we are wasting away. But the inner person is being renewed day by day. Is that what happens to you? Do you spend the time with the Lord and is He renewing you day by day? When you hear His word or you listen to a word, does He give you that newness inside? Is He strengthening you? We see TV ads, we see the gyms, we see all that for the outward man. But here he's talking about this inward man. That's why we go to church. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have Bible study. So that the inward man can be renewed as we're dealing with this stuff in our lives. I could bring up people here today who know that because of the strength they gain through doing these exercises in their heart with God. And that their inner man was strength that he carried them through the most difficult times in their life. And it's because God did it. In the Greek word, the inner man, it means the soul part of your life that feeds everything else. Because, you see, as Paul knew in verse 13, he said, we get discouraged. They were getting discouraged because they were watching their loved ones get killed. They were being beat. They were experiencing pressure about the job if they're not, and, and all kinds of pressures. And we get to surge over circumstances. We also find ourselves with the monotonous routines. We get ourselves in trouble. Or sometimes we get physical weakness and we get sick and we get discouraged. Or when we have a personal failure, when we sin and we're so surprised that we did something like this. Or when we have uninterrupted, unwanted uninterrupted, uh, interruptions in our life. And they throw us way off kilter. Or some responsibilities that we never fulfill. Even inner conflicts that we have. And you see, Paul comes to us and prays for us to be strong. And that we don't lose heart. You see, because a lot of times... You monitor your prayer life. Do you think that most of the time we pray when our life is not doing too good? Lord, this hurts. <laughs> or, Lord, this hurts. Could you stop this right now? Could you fix this for me? Or, Lord, I don't like what's going on in my life. Please change it. And maybe it's a messenger from God to your life to put pressure on you to grow and to deepen with Him. Those two categories happen to us all the time. And we like to avoid things that are painful. Get me out of here now, Lord. That's human. It's in those times that we learn sometimes the most. I'm not so hot and I'm not so strong and I'm not so resilient and I'm not so resourceful. I need God here. Lord, take away my burdens. <laughs> and what we need to be is have the strength to be willing to daily task with joy. That the temptations that we have, we can face with courage of faith. That we can endure persecution gladly. Paul prays for us that we have this inner spiritual strength. And then he says that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is realized. That we make Christ a home in our hearts. I don't know about you, but I don't like staying over other people's houses. And I went to North Carolina and I had to do that. They said, make yourself at home. Yeah, right. I can't walk around in my boxer shorts. I'd be in pretty, pretty trouble with that family, wouldn't I? I can't. Well, never mind. But 
we want Jesus to take residence in our hearts. That's what this passage says here. It says here, make him in our hearts, in our inner being, to dwell, to live in our hearts, and to go through the junk. I don't know about you, but I have a problem when people go through my junk, and I got a lot of junk. And when people organize me, because I know where it is sometimes, but I know the Bible here says to us to have Christ dwell in your heart. And that dwelling means that he sets up shop in the home of your heart. Robert Muntz wrote a beautiful little booklet. If you ever want to read a beautiful little book, in fact, I might have a couple around here. My Heart, Christ Home. And have him go through your house of your heart. And he walks in and Jesus walks in. And he sees what you feed yourself in the library. And then he looks at the food that you take and begins to tell you, you got to get rid of these books. This food is not good for you. And oh, that closet upstairs that you have a lot of your secret things, I need to go up in that closet too and see what you got. Well, wait a minute, Lord. No, you invite me into your house. And you ask me to be the Lord. And so that means I can go anywhere in this house and look at anything that you got and begin to clean it out. And then he goes on and he says to us, we need to be rooted and grounded. The word root, we know from the Psalm 1, where you know, we're, we are like a tree planted by the river water. When you're rooted, you're deep in the ground so you're not easily blown by wind. And your, your roots are in the ground so you can receive nutrition and nourishment from the groundwater. And the nutrition from the dirt. So you can become a strong, solid tree. And the psalmist says that. Don't delight, but we delight in the Lord who made who who we meditate day and night, and we're like a tree planted by the river's water that constantly has water coming to make it stronger and stronger and to build it. And that's what we do. And we're like trees as we grow in Christ and we continue to eat up what He wants for us. And then He says, and you're like a building. He uses another word here. Not only are we rooted, but we're planted. We're grounded in love. That means like a building that's being built in a city or any foundation. Houses need foundations that are good. And we've seen many of them float away in the south this, this spring. So they have a good foundation. And the foundation we need to build with Christ is deep and strong. So that we don't get washed away. And that we can stand the test of time. And notice what he says. Grounded in what? And comprehend what? His love. This comprehension means that we grasp it. You ever see a monkey when they go on a tree and they, my grandkids get a kick out of this, when they take their tail and wrap it around and swing? That grips it. And he says, we need to grasp a hold of what God has for us. And especially his love. Because that's the basis of everything. And when we grasp that, it makes a total difference. And the results are tremendous to comprehend that God's love. That he will never throw us out. He will never walk away from us. W.A. Criswell wrote this about John 3.16. He says, For God so loved the world, it's the breath that he included me. And that he gave his son the length. What God did for me, the length he went to give his own son for me. 
I said, I should not perish to death that I don't have to go to hell. But he reached down and pulled me out and have everlasting life at the height going to heaven. You see, that's what the cross is. The cross reaches across and says, you are mine. And I pulled you out of the depths so that you could go to heaven. That's the message of the cross. And what a great illustration. And you know, that love of Christ doesn't grow weary of you. I have noticed in my marriage, we've been married for 47 years, and our love has changed quite drastically. And it's so different now and solid and firm and strong. And I can remember that weak little love that we have when we first started out and then we got married and all the difficulties we went through. And as we went through those, it got stronger and trusting more and loving more. And we see here God's love is that way for us. And he gets you. He gets me. And he wants us to understand that love that stands behind us. And he never just gets, well, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you. He doesn't get that way. He doesn't look at you and say, well, aren't you a glad little happy thing and I'm going to mess you up. No, that's not God. He loves you. He wants to pray this for your life. Because you're his child. Most important foundation that you could ever have is understanding that love. And it says it passes all understanding. But yet this is Paul's petition. That we understand the depth and the height of this love. And then he says that you will be filled to overflowing with it. I don't know about you, but I go to Atlantic Ocean sometimes and I think about what it would take for me to take a bucket and keep on emptying it. <laughs> impossible. That's God's love. It's impossible to empty. And he wants us to experience the fullness of it that it keeps on flowing into your life to strengthen you and to give you the strength you need every day how much he loves you and then to the praise of his glory look at what this is the last part of it he said now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you ask or think according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen his doxology begins now, it's, it's him. You see, that's where we got to get right, right away. It's him. It's him who does it. And at that point, then we trust him. And we know that his love is there forever and never lets us go. And even in the impossible, he makes it possible. And if you notice what it says there, he is able that means he's not some weak God. He's not inactive in your life. He's very active in your life. And what we ask, he already knows. But we come to him in prayer. He knows before time and he knows exactly what you need. Not only is he omniscient, but he's omnipotent that he can do what we need. More than we could ever ask. His dream for you is bigger than you'll ever imagine. You just got to believe that. And that it's much more than you ever thought it would be. That's God thinking of you. And that he wants to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you ever imagined with your life. The Greek word is phenomenal. It's hooper, which means beyond. Ek means out of. And persuio, which means abundantly. And what we see here, God has off the charts for you the abilities to handle the things that you're handling. But you've got to trust Him. And you've got to understand the depth of His love for you. How much far beyond it is. And how He is the one who can do it for you. 
That's the whole score. And that he is able. And this whole idea of love, you know, when, when you think about the fruits of the Spirit, joy is God's love at work. Gentleness is God's love and care. Faithfulness is God working out in your life patience. Self-control is God love giving you the ability to stand straight and strong. See, that's all from God's love and he's the one that's able. He can bring us through all kinds of things. But we need to trust him. And Paul's prayer is for us, and that's what we need to pray for ourselves. That we can are able to understand that love and the depth of it so much so that our faith doesn't wander and crack, that it doesn't fail ourselves, but we're truly invested in Him who gives us this love. This morning, our first hymn we sang, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Powerful hymn. If you know anything about some hymns, there are some hymns that people wrote thinking about things. That hymn was written by a woman who knew how much she had to trust in Jesus and how he helped her. It comes from a, a woman in Long Island, New York. Sunday afternoon, her, her daughter, and husband on a beach in Long Island by the Atlantic Ocean, put down their blanket, start eating, and they hear cry for help. A young man out in the ocean, drowning. And her husband does, picks up and runs and goes to save that young man who's drowning. Tragically, he loses his life along with the boy. That woman, in a day when they didn't have social services and help. God gave her the ability to get through that, her and her daughter to survive and eat and take care of the rent. And she came to realize that the way she only could do that was to trust in Jesus. And so she wrote that hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, losing her husband, just to take him at his word. God took her and delivered her and her daughter and helped them through that tragedy because she was enabled through the Holy Spirit to be able to deal with that and the inner strength of God through our Savior Jesus gave her the strength to do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, today we come to you and we thank you for Paul's prayer. We pray that that prayer can be for each one of us, that we can understand the height and the depth, the breadth, of your love in our hearts and that we can be enabled to do things we're fearful of, to conquer, to be able to take challenges in our lives and the trials in our lives and walk through them trusting you and you will enable us to get through them and gain victory to them. Lord Jesus, we thank you for such a rich history for such rich love that is so far deeper than we could ever imagine or think. I ask you, Christ, 
for each person here to experience that every day with the fullness of your love flowing through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song and we receive our benediction. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, your Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now to the day He takes you. Amen.